Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Notre, New Hampshire. Our website's are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address, should you like to shoot me a very brief email with a comment, question, or suggestion, is bam at catholicism.org. That's bam at catholicism.org. Um, you can also find me on social media. Just search for Brother Andre Marie, and you should find me there if I'm there. Uh, this evening's episode is episode number 336, and I'm calling it From Hyperpapalism to Catholicism, and that's because I'm basically stealing the name of uh, the book of my guest, who is Dr. Peter A. Kwasniewski, who should not need an introduction to my audience. And since we have an awful lot to discuss, I won't you know, read any of his bio. You can you can find this out uh, in any number of websites that the good doctor writes for. Uh, g- good evening, Dr. Kwasniewski. Yes, good evening, brother. Uh, so you've come out with a, a new couple of books. It's a two-volume set called The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism. And um, uh, full disclosure, I have only read volume one, and uh, which we agreed ahead of time would be really the subject of, of our discussion this evening because it gives the principles, the theological principles, and the second volume goes into, um, you know, some of the some of the high points or low points, as it were, of the present uh, pontificate, and uh, it gives you sort of concrete ways to apply the principles that you enunciate in Volume One. So, um, why don't we begin with uh, just sort of defining our terms a bit? What exactly do you mean by hyperpapalism? Yes, it's in a way, it's a a slightly redundant term, because I think one could also just as well say papalism, uh, with the ism suggesting um, almost an elevation of a particular principle into um, a universal principle. Um, you know the way that we we derive Catholicism from Catholic. Uh, so so you could say any time that that the Pope is seen as. Uh, the 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 definition or the sum total or the the linchpin or what have you of the entire Catholic faith, um, it's a kind of papalism, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but hyper papalism suggests an exaggerated, uh, uh, you know, excessive veneration of the person of the Pope or an excessive adherence to everything he says, all the all the dicta et acta of the Pope whatever they may be good bad indifferent um and so it's a it's a it's it's an it's an excess right if we think about uh, if we think about it in terms of aristotelian virtue theory right there's the golden mean and then you have excess and defect um Mm -hmm. the defect would be rejecting the papacy altogether um either either in principle as the protestants do or de facto as the orthodox do um, but the excess would be, you know, misinterpreting the role of the Pope and exaggerating it. So if, if uh, virtus stat in medio, uh, if virtue stands in the middle, uh, then the true Orthodox Catholic position is going to be avoiding the sort of the um, uh, scylla and charybdis of, of the, the, the Lutheran uh, rejection of, of the papacy on the one side and the um, and the sort of to use to use one of your words, hypertrophic, uh, um, sort of bloated no- notion of the papacy. On the other hand, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the way, by the way, you, you use the word hypertrophism a lot, a couple times in the book, and you also introduced me to the word fissiparous. So I thank you for giving me an expanded <laughs> vocabulary. <laughs> um, you know, the word fissiparous is just one of those words that, at least once you know it, it's almost impossible not to want to use it. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm that way. I have to, I'll have to find some way to sneak it into something I wrote just so that I sound erudite. But it's also a useful word because it's this multiplication by division. You're 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 talking about Protestantism and how it just sort of breaks up. Mm-hmm. And breaks up and breaks up. Um, so the um, uh, if the the ex- so it, we're avoiding these two extremes and we're, we're shooting for the the, the v- virtue which is in the middle. Um, now, again, in the in the area of defining terms, the term ultramontanism is used a lot in Catholic circles, and it, it means you know o- over the mountains, you know the, the the northern Europeans who look to papal authority um, against sort of the spirit of Gallicanism or the spirit of um, 
uh, any of the um, kind of Gallican-like errors that had floated around Europe, and they looked to the authority of the Pope as the head of the church. Uh, so there's that ultramontanism that that would you know you'd c- categorize say Cardinal P or G- Dom Guerinjay or people like that as ultramontanists, uh, but then. Uh, there was kind of an exaggerated ultramontanism. So are you against the use of the word ultramontanism, or do you think that it's just this exaggerated ultramontanism that's the problem? Yes. I, and I, I've had a bit of an, of an evolution in my, in my use of that word. Um, years ago, I used to think that ultramontanism simply meant um, an, an exaggerated adherence to the, the person or, or acts or deeds of the pope. Um, but I was I was sort of put in my place by by a friend Roberto de Mattei as well as by Jose Ureta, uh, whom I don't know personally, but just by correspondence, who who both explained very very patiently and I think I think very charitably in in a number of articles that they've published that um, ultramontanism is a historical phenomenon. It describes a certain loosely defined group of of associates and allies in the 19th century who were all, as you said, looking to the Pope for guidance in a period of revolution, in a period of of, of false uh, proposals for reform, a uh, period of anti-clericalism and Freemasonry and so on. Um, and, and really, ultramontanism is, in a sense, a neutral historical descriptive term. And those people um, were were actually promoting something good at the time, something good and necessary, um, and that should be sharply distinguished from from this the hypertrophic or uh, the exaggerated papalism that we're talking about. Okay, let me let me just say there there were within the ultramontanist spectrum. It, it was a spectrum. And there were people who were extreme ultramontanists. Um, oh, okay, can we can we can we uh, pivot on that and go sure. a little deeper into that question? Because um, the next thing I was going to ask you is about Newman and the inopportunists at Vatican mm-hmm. One, but mm-hmm. these things um, coalesce because there there was around the time of Vatican One, and I'm going to say especially in France, at the risk of offending some people, perhaps. Uh, there were people who, and I think it's because they didn't have the scholastic foundation that, say, Spaniards and others had, um, when they were considering the, these these theological questions. Um, they, for instance, the, the 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 false traditionalism, you know, the the, the idea that that all uh, knowledge comes through language and we can't trust our senses. So Vatican One actually had to to, to talk about the the. Um, reliability of the senses and, and the fact that reason is is important as well as faith. Um, so th- there was this no- there were these false notions that were wrapped up with some of the um, it, it, I should say into the, some of the same persons who were defending papal infallibility. Right. I mean, so you had um, I forget if it was Louis uh, Louis de, uh, de Villot or some of these guys had some weird philosophical errors wrapped up. Right. Yes, yes. And in fact, uh, you know, one article that I would definitely recommend to to listeners is the one that I published at 1 Peter 5 about a week ago um, called uh, The Spirit of Vatican I as a Post-Revolutionary Problem. Um, And there I talk about Louis Vuillot a little bit. I talk about Joseph de Mestre and the, the, the theories of absolute political power that were being taken from a secular domain and applied in a sacred domain or in in the you know in the hierarchy of the church uh, to the papacy, um, and and these were these were these views of absolute authority were proposed as a way to crush liberalism once and for all. Right, what you need is a kind of almighty pope who will just step on. You know the European liberals uh, on the, you know, and 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 crush them, right? Um, and so, it, what what they don't seem to have entertained the possibility of, or maybe they did, and they just thought it. They they thought this could never happen. God would never allow this to happen. Is what you know a pope who himself was a liberal, right? Uh, they they never yeah. you know that that didn't occur to them. You know that what, what happens if you if you give um, you know sort of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, you know, to a certain office because the person in it is, um, well, let's say the person in it is Trump 
and then you get Biden, right? And they, but they both have the nuclear arsenal, right? This, this is a bad situation. Um, I, that's maybe a silly example, but you understand the point. I'm yeah, making. yeah, it's a great point. I mean, uh, and that <clears throat> that absolutizing of power which was a reaction against the revolution, they, they should have known that in the persons of these enlightened monarchs in Europe, quote unquote, that some of the ones who led to the revolution, you know, were these were these uh, royals and aristocrats who who were sort of hanging out in the same uh, parlors as uh, Voltaire and Diderot and these guys. Yes. Yes. Now, this is a very important point. If you look at the history of the papacy, one of the most striking features of it is the dogged conservatism, the dogged traditionalism in the in the in the usual sense of the word of the incumbents of the papacy? They are not interested in innovation or novelty. Um, they are not interested in uh, aggiornamento in you know bringing the church up to date to the contemporary world of, of their time. Um, they're they are interested in holding fast to the faith that was handed down. And using their authority to defend it, to explicate it, to refute or condemn heresies against it. Um, but basically, you know, you could forgive some of the ultramontanes, uh, ultramontanists, for thinking that they would always have a pope who was a stalwart uh, defender of the Catholic faith um, and, and who was, in a sense, um, anointed from above with an infallible, in, in, with infallibility, not only as regards solemn teaching, but even just as regards ordinary teaching and and disciplinary and governant uh, governance actions. Um, so this is the kind of view that that we're dealing with, and it, it does seem to me as if the minority at this at the first Vatican Council, Newman, of course, wasn't there because he had no, no business being there, but he was following it very closely. The, the minority, some of whom were Gallicans, um, Newman himself wasn't a Gallican, uh, they, they were objecting on the basis of the record of church history shows a much more symbiotic and holistic relationship of, of the Pope and the episcopacy around the world. And you might say <clears throat> the the corporate responsibility for Catholic tradition, that all the bishops as successors of the apostles receive the tradition, all of them are called upon to defend it. They're not vicars of the Pope. They don't receive their office and authority from the Pope. They receive it directly from Christ, um, even if he appoints them, uh, the Pope appoints them. So th I think this is what the minority was trying to, to bring out and to defend and to uphold. Okay, now uh, along those same lines, um, much later in the book, of course, I haven't actually opened the book yet as far as asking you specific questions in the book, but on page 129, there's a there's a, a section called The Shepherds We Have and the Shepherds We Need, and you quote a, a, a lady uh, named Browden McShay um, who talks about, in an article called Bishops Unbound, actually, I don't know if you're quoting her. No, you, you're, you're paraphrasing her, but um, she points out that in the last two centuries, uh, we've seen a centralization of ecclesiastical power in the hands of bishops and the Pope like nothing ever before seen in the history of the Catholic Church. Prior to this turn towards unification, concentration, and exclusivity, the Church was far more diversified in its power base. The laity primarily uh, in its princes, aristocrats, and guilds, the cl clergy in their cathedral chapters and associations co-determined the matter in which the Church was governed. Okay, and, and it goes on. As I was reading this, I made sort of a marginal note uh, that th that relative to, and again, we're making an analogy with the political realm, uh, specifically in the realm of European monarchies. Uh, and in the European monarchies, you, you had this uh, immediate pre-revolutionary idea of monarchical absolutism, uh, which was really not traditional. It was something that that was kind of an abuse, and it stepped in the right traditional rights of the aristocracy and, and of the guilds and of um, similar um, sort of intermediate type organizations that stood between the state and the family. But um, it, but then you have, um, I mean, I, I have this sort of loyalty. I'm part Spanish, towards Carlism, towards Spanish Carlism. And the idea that uh, in, in, the Carlists, I think, who were very philosophically based, um, had this much more diffused concept of authority 
uh, and they respected first the rights of God, then um, the traditional rights of, 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 of the local rights, local rule, they call it fueros in Spanish. Uh, and they they also had the, the place for the king, but he was the last of the four um, Carlist pillars, Dios, Patria, Fueros y Rey. Um, it, it, and, and it seems to more closely resemble the medieval notion where, yeah, there is a, what we might call checks and balances, but the checks and balances aren't, you know, the, the three branches like we have in the Constitution of the United States, mm-hmm. but they were really tradition, uh, the, the moral law, you know, the faith itself, and also these different um, uh, local customs in these different places so that you didn't just hyper amalgamate everything into this big national glob. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Now, exactly. do you find that to be kind of a fit analogy with the way power was tr- more traditionally diffused in the church? Exactly. No, that's that's a perfect analogy. Um, I mean, obviously, we know um, that it's part it's part of the Catholic faith that the Pope and the bishops have a special place in the church. They are the the hierarchical authorities in the church uh, who rule and teach and sanctify in the name of Jesus Christ and by his power. So there's no question here of a kind of democratic church or the way that some people are thinking of speaking of synodality nowadays as like a little bit of this group and a little bit of that group, and they all put their ideas together and act on them. Um, It's very bureaucratic. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there's nothing that, but what the tradition shows us, what history shows us is a different kind of diversification and responsibility where every member of the mystical body, but especially I would say the more prominent members among the laity, um, and then certainly the lower clergy as well as the higher clergy, that uh, that but everyone in the church felt himself to be responsible for the church and for the Catholic faith, that everyone had received it in baptism, um, had been strengthened in it by confirmation, uh, was, you know, was in fact, um, uh, the, the census fidei right, is, is relevant in this regard, that, that every baptized member of the church, if he is properly catechized, if he's living a sacramental life, that he has a certain sense of what is in accord with the faith, what is in harmony with the faith. The way, the way that St. Thomas speaks about, about the, the virtuous man has an instinct for what is in accord with virtue and is repulsed by what is vicious. Um, he talks about that especially in, in connection with the virtue of temperance, right? Um, it's not, you know, so the, the there would be a sense then in which if a, if a medieval king saw or an emperor saw that a pope or a bishop was acting out of line, um, either in terms of prudential governance or in terms of of teaching, then they would just simply say they would they would they would object. Uh, and they would oppose it in whatever way they could, uh, and and sometimes even threaten, uh, because again, of this sense of co-responsibility. Mm-hmm. And that's not a, that's not a kind of an anti-clericalism. It's it's a it's a I guess it's the ecclesia uh, decens exercising its responsibility to to protect the deposit of faith, even if the ecclesia uh, docens is getting out of hand. Right, right. I mean, you you could you could think of it this way that that um, in a healthy functioning body, um, well, I, I don't know if you could make, if there's really a medical metaphor here that, that, I, could, that I could use, but what I'm, what I'm thinking of is, is you know, in, in normal healthy functioning circumstances, certain members of the church can simply accept what they're being given and get on with their lives. But in an emergency situation, when there's sort of an autoimmune condition and the body is attacking itself, that's when, when you know, the soul, the principle of life in the church, the Holy Spirit, stirs up many, you know, organs and, and cells in the body to, to defend and to try to repair and to repulse, you know, whatever the harm is that, that's taking place. So there's no question here that that in a in a in a healthy situation, you know, ca- Catholics should simply be able to listen to the Pope and the bishops and their local pastors, uh, with with you know humble uh, acceptance and gratitude and obedience. So we're, we're, to to question um, the wrong kind of of leadership in the church is not to be anti-leadership to be mm-hmm. antinomian or anti-obedience uh, or something like that. That's what our, that's what our op- opponents always try to throw at us. 
Yeah, and I thought you addressed that um, more than adequately in the book in a couple of spots. Um, there, there's a, there's a you, you coined, I think, oh, you're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of our Touch Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie, and I'm interviewing Dr. Peter Kwasniewski uh, on his book, his new two-volume book called The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism, published by Aruka Press. Um and I'll have a link to it from the Reconquest.net page where you can get that book at Aruka Press. Uh, but, uh, okay, so you coined the phrase. I think you coined it. It's been used, and I think it's been um, – t- I think I got the impression from your book that somebody had taken umbrage with it. Uh, when I first saw it in print, I kind of winced, and then I thought about it and said, okay, this can obviously be understood in a correct way. The false spirit of Vatican I. You speak, <laughs> you speak of the false spirit. Spirit of Vatican. Am I right? You got some blowback on that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because yes. it was it, in the book. You have a footnote where you, where you talked about the the uh, the uh, exaggerated reception of papal infallibility after the First Vatican Council, and you said this is obviously what I meant when I wrote the false spirit of Vatican yes. One. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I mean, they, you know, on that point, it's it's just simply a fact that there was a minimalist and a maximalist interpretation of the decree Pastor Eternus, um, especially what it says about the Pope's infallibility and about his supreme and universal jurisdiction. <clears throat> um, you know, and the, the Newman himself, I think, makes a very good case that we should, that it's, it's, hel- it's proper, um, it's humbler, it's more... Um, it's more in keeping with the spirit of the church to interpret things in a minimalist way. That is, as not demanding more than the face value of what's there in its context with everything else. So, um, you know, the, 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 as you probably know, Bismarck uh, was very upset with Pastor Eternus, Bismarck of Germany, mm-hmm. the chancellor. Um, and a clarification was issued uh, that um, by the German bishops... Uh, that Pope Pius IX approved. And when you read that, it's a minimalist interpretation or, uh, yeah, interpretation of Pastor Eternus. It takes, it, it says the least that needs to be said on the basis of Pastor Eternus rather than, um, in a sense, blowing it up uh, and, and making it something that it, that it doesn't have to be, Right. Now, now, my my mentor, Brother Francis, used to uh, he, he taught me that Vatican I was a gift to the Church in more than one way. Not only did it teach him papal infallibility, but also it also limited it because mm-hmm. there were these exaggerated notions um, among the many of the say less philosophically based uh, ultramontanists, um, and those errors got kind of cor- corrected, at least implicitly corrected. Yes. In, in, yes. There, sorry. No, well, well, well but my, my, so my question is, did Vatican II sufficiently explain the limits or did it not go far enough? And I have a follow-up. Yeah, well, um, I did want to say one last point about Vatican I. There was a German bishop, Bishop Heffler there. He was a, his, a church historian. Um, and he, he, was of, he wrote the history of the councils, the multi-volume history right. of the councils. That's right. And he, he was one of the last holdouts on the definition. He, it... it, it um, displeased him very much as a church historian. He did accept it in the end, but he accepted it on the basis of a minimalist interpretation, and the Pope accepted that. The Pope said, yes, you can you can do it this way. In my article at 1 Peter 5, I go into more detail about what the difference between the minimalist and the maximalist interpretations would look like, um, or do look, do look like. Um, yeah, but about Vatican II... Um, well, you know, I, I may have said Vatican II, and I meant to say Vatican I. My oh, question was, oh. did Vatican I go far enough in limiting papal infallibility? Or well, it, yes. Here, so here's here's what I think, is that the, the, the definition of infallibility, which, as you know, I talk about, um, I quote it, and I, I, I quote especially Adrian Fortescue's commentary on it, which I think is really, really excellent. Yes, I have, um, I have that it's, highlighted. It's very, very precise, crystal clear um, analysis of what it says and what it doesn't say. It, it really is, it, what it's doing is it's exalting the Pope's God-given uh, role to teach the entire church bindingly on a matter of faith and morals. 
um, if he judges it to be necessary, without the consent of the rest of the church, without the bishop saying, yes, go ahead, we give you the green light. Um, but he, he has to be defining something, ex cathedra, in a solemn way, indicate that he's doing so. Uh, and as has been pointed out, this is typically accompanied by some kind of anathema against those who don't hold what is being defined. And so in the end, when it comes to dogmatic infallibility as proper to the Pope, it's a, it's a quite narrow situation that's being mm -hmm. described. Um, it's not papal encyclicals, apostolic letters, post-synodal apostolic exhortations, general audiences, airplane interviews, <laughs> etc. right? None of that stuff is, yeah. is what's being talked about. Where, where I think it's a little more troublesome uh, and, and where, frankly, a lot of the, the tension comes in the church today between traditionalists and, let's say, Pope Francis, um, but not only Pope Francis, of course, uh, is, is in the area of jurisdiction, in, the, in, in what the Pope is allowed to decree, what he can command and forbid, right? It, that is to say, in the realm of, of prudential and disciplinary decisions, um, that's really where the, I think a lot of the, um, the, 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 the anguish and the arguments take place. Um, Vatican one's formulation of that is, is quite open-ended. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, at least in Pastor Eternus, it doesn't really limit, um, the, the Pope's power in the prudential or practical domain to legislate. Uh -huh. However, however, <clears throat> and this is a very important point. Pastor Eternus is not the only document of Vatican I. There's also Dei Filius, which you alluded to earlier. And in Dei Filius, we learn that each Christian uh, is equipped by God with two powers, the power of reason and the supernatural power of faith. Um, and so the, the, the individual Christian um, not that he is certainly the, he can't be the sole judge, but he is by his own reason a judge of when there's a flagrant contradiction, like the contradiction between Familiaris Consortio and Amoris Laetitia, mm -hmm. or between Veritatis Splendor and everything that Pope Francis has done in the world. <laughs> okay. um, and, uh, and, you know, and reason tells us that there is this contradiction, and Vatican I is a great defender of that natural power of reason. And similarly, as it, this is a little bit the point I was making earlier about the census fidei, um, Vatican I is very keen to say that faith is a real gift infused in us, given to us, by which we can adhere to and discern um, you know, divinely revealed mysteries, divinely revealed truths. Um, and so, again, we're not simply beholden to the Pope for these things, as if we're, we're sort of like, mindless automata, you know, and, and we have to, and we have to just say, you know, fill me up, uh, um, your Holy Father, because I have no faculties of my own by which to know the Catholic faith, right? Uh -huh. Um, and, and then with, the, with, within this, this area of jurisdiction, if a Pope were to, let's say, attack, uh, the common good of the church in the form of its traditional liturgy, uh, which which both Newman and Ratzinger say would be contrary to the spirit of the church to attack the traditional liturgy, um, then a layman, a lowly layman, who is no part of the hierarchy, can still say both non possumus, we can't go along with this, and non licet, it's not yeah. even lawful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so there's a, a, you know, as I'm listening to you, it, it came to mind that yeah, and I'm no canonist, but in, in, if I understand correctly, in the Code of Canon Law, the current Code of Canon Law, Co uh, Canon 87, has a little appendage of this kind of subsidiarity where the bishop can sort of override certain papal decrees and say, well, this isn't going to apply in my diocese because of this situation. And that's yes. what some of the bishops are doing with uh, Traditionis Custodes. Yes, exactly. Canon 87 is an amazing canon because it, it, it says... The bishop can, um, I, I, I don't have my code of canon law right next to me, so I don't remember the exact phrasing of it, but basically the bishop can choose to suspend or not to apply a law in his diocese, even if it comes from the supreme authority. That's what it says. Yeah. You know, you're clearly talking about the pope, right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, Archbishop Sample and uh, Bishop, um, the Bishop of Lake Charles, John Provost, uh, oh, Louis, and, my home, my home state. <laughs> yeah, and and Bishop um, Bishop Olmsted, 
I believe, are three, and they're not the only ones who have invoked Canon 87. Uh, Bishop Paprocki, um, I believe. Uh, maybe I was thinking of Paprocki instead of Olmsted. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think I think that Sample is a canonist himself, and I think he was the first, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but now, now, okay, so we're talking about. Uh, so he, here, I have a follow up that I told you about that uh, about about a, a future ecumenical council. Now, sort of. Uh, now, Venerable Bartholomew Holtzhauser, whom you quote on something else in the book, um, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things he prophesied in an approved uh, p- private revelations talked about um, a future ecumenical council that will, if I'm remembering his exact words correctly, um, uh, make clear the proper interpretation of Scripture. Um, and I know the Colby Center people uh, make a big deal about uh, Venerable, uh, I mean, properly so, of, of uh, Venerable uh, Bartholomew Holtzhauser. Um, and this future council, which interestingly, there's a Russian mystic who also prophesied a future council. And I kind of have my ideas about how it's the same council and it'll be a reunion council, like picking up where Leon and Florence failed. Mm-hmm. Um, Leon II and Florence failed. But so, so okay, here's a scenario. It's the year 2045. And an aging and venerable Dr. Peter Krasniewski is asked to be a paritas at, at the second <laughs> council, the second council of Trent. Okay, uh, things are bad in Rome, so they, you know, the 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 pig problem is continuing in Rome. They have all these all these uh, swine run, overrunning Rome, like it's literally happening now. I understand. Um, and so they have to go up north to to, to Trento. Uh, now, what would your chief proposals be for completing the work of Vatican I on papal infallibility, to clarify it, in light of the debacle that happened after Vatican II and also the false interpretation of Vatican I? What, what would your proposals be, mm. Paritas, a, Paritas yeah. Peter? <laughs> That's a marvelous question. Uh, I, I feel like it's a question that, that I would, you know, in in a way, I should sit with for a few hours uh, before before trying to answer. But one one thing I would certainly say is that there needs to be much greater clarity about the Pope's boundedness to tradition, um, and and not just tradition with a capital T, um, which is which is is rather difficult to pin down what exactly that that contains. Um, but all but tradition in all of its dimensions, including ecclesiastical traditions with a with a with an S. On the end, um, and so it, it seems to me that implicitly throughout the whole history of the church, the popes have seen themselves as guardians, tr- truly as custodes traditionis. They have really <laughs> seen themselves that way. Um, but that that was more or less chucked out the window by, especially by Paul the Sixth, to a lesser extent by John the Twenty Third and Pius the Twelfth. Um, but really, all of the modern popes seem to have imbibed this um, this really the spirit of the the maximalist um, view of Vatican I that um, that nothing can stop them from reconfiguring Catholic life according to their own lights about what the modern age needs um, and and nothing can stop them from doing that because they will be protected by God from ever making a catastrophic mistake. Um, and, you know, it, I can't take seriously the idea that we have not seen catastrophic mistakes. I mean, I know there are still, you know, websites like where Peter is, really, you know, they've never seen a papal decision or decree that they don't love, you know. Yes, but, yes. But, 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 I mean, for me, it's, you know, and for, for many of us who've studied these things, it's, you know, the, the 20th and 21st centuries are one catastrophe after the next in a certain sense. Um, you know, it's a, kind of like a, like a, a, a papacy drunkenly stumbling from one scandalous thing to another. Um, and I mean, not, obviously, I'm not saying that that's all that there is. There are plenty of good things m- mixed in there as well. So I think there needs to be a great clarification about um, the Pope's boundedness to tradition. And the best way to enforce that would be to reintroduce um, the papal oath, the coronation oath, mm-hmm. um, in the form in which it's found in the uh, in, in the in the in the first millennium um, in the what is it the Liber, uh, the you, you'll you'll be able to help me out with this the Liber Pontificalis, um, the, know, pon- there's, there's po- a, the Pontificali Romanum. Uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about it. It's a it's like a, a book of chronicles uh, from the first millennium that has the papal oath written into it. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I, I can't help you there, but I, I I know I've seen it written, but I I don't have it yes. in my memory. Uh, that so that would be. I mean, if you read the text of that oath, which is contained in, um, I have a. 
lecture called The Pope's Boundedness to Tradition, which is in the book from Benedict's piece, The Francis's War. It's also on, on Rorate Celi. But I quote uh, a nice, freshly made English translation of that papal oath, and it's really remarkable because it hits every every topic that needs to be hit. You know, the, the Pope swears to guard the sacramental rights of the church as they've been handed to him and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, referring to the traditional sacramental rights, not to, to the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one thing. Um, another thing would be to clarify very carefully um, what Vatican II meant when it said that bishops are not merely vicars of the Pope. Um, so I, I think that there would be something like maybe this would be, require a revision of canon law that um, no bishop could be deposed without due process and without some kind of um, – there, there has to be some kind of process to prevent what happened to Bishop Torres. In, in, in Puerto, Puerto Rico, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, do you have any suggestions for me? <laughs> oh, oh, what, what, oh, oh, what, what the Paritas could do? Well, I, I don't. Yes. I, well, I mean, I, I, I was going to say something about the papal oath because, because to me, that oath itself shows you the limited character of the papacy. That he's that he is, in a sense, the most bound man on earth because he has to receive something from his predecessors. There, there's an exact mention of what he has received from his predecessors, which, of course, yes. is the very no notion, the very concept of tradition. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and you know, there, there's this phenomenon we're seeing a lot with Pope Francis. I mean, it existed already prior to him, but he's really, he's taken it in a sort of, uh, you know, warp speed direction. But what I call the magisterium of me, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, or, or the or the or the magisterium of the moment. Yes, um, and and the, the, probably the most outrageous example of that is the death penalty change to the catechism, where you know there's a new text given with the 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 fishy the highly suspicious word inadmissible which has never been used in any context before so nobody knows exactly what it means um, I argue in volume two there that that it, it certainly means um, immoral that's the only way that it can be taken in context but he has a footnote a single footnote and it's to a speech by himself <laughs> that, yeah. that he that he gave you know not too long before in which he says that the death penalty is per se contrary to the gospel and to human dignity. Um, I mean, this is this is you know uh, the the what I like to call the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Uh -huh. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, what's your basis for this? You know, well, actually, you can't really point to any source in the tradition that says the death penalty is inherently wrong. Certainly, not any author you know any authority that would be that would have a binding nature on us. But um, but you can certainly point to gobs and gobs of sources that do, in fact. Um, uh, say that the state has the 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 right to inflict the the uh, you know the death penalty in certain circumstances. And in the in the book you quote I think it's a Benedictine friend and then and right after you quoted the Dominican friend saying essentially the same thing. But uh, the issue is not the issue. I think was in other words yeah. the, 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 that he he and he was talking about this particular thing and he says essentially it's not just that he wanted to change this teaching. He inserted into the catechism this just like do dogma by fiat you know doctrine by fiat. I just you know, sort of like yes. modern money. I just made dogma. You know, look, I have yes. the, because yes. I have the Vatican press at my service, right? And and and, and in fact, this is this is all extremely dangerous because, <clears throat> as even the conservative Catholics are seeing more and more, you know, not not even us extremists and restorationists, <laughs> but but um, you know, even the conservative Catholics are are watching with dismay as you know the the so-called Pontifical Academy for Life which was gutted by Francis and reconfigured, yes. is turning into a think tank for um, questioning and trying to overthrow humane vitae, donum vitae, you know, <clears throat> um, all, all of these, uh, these, these, um, uh, these watershed moments when the, the Pope or the CDF actually upheld perennial Catholic moral teaching on, um, on, on human sexuality. So uh, th this idea of a, a kind of what we've talked about, I think, before, Darwinian or Hegelian um, development of doctrine, evolution of doctrine, where you can sort of pull a new doctrine out of the hat, pull, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat or, or pulling a, uh, you know, 
pulling a dove out of a miter, as I like to say. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you, know, um, you know, that that that's exactly what, what Pope Francis does. You know, they just wave the wand of development of doctrine and suddenly, uh, oh, contraception is acceptable in some circumstance, or in vitro fertilization is acceptable in some circumstance. Homosexual, homosexual unions are acceptable in some circumstances. You know, we haven't quite gotten to the end of this process, but it is a process that is very visibly going on right now. Um, now, let me just say one last thing about the Council of Trent, the Second Council of Trent. <laughs> um, I think it would also be fully in keeping with the teaching of Pastor Eternus to say in the in the Council of Trent, the Second Council of Trent, um, that any time the Pope teaches not ex cathedra, not to define a matter of faith and morals, which is to say, like ninety nine point nine and ninety nine percent of the time. Um, that his the, his uh, decrees or his texts have to be approved by, let's say, a plenary session of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or maybe even the College of Cardinals, or something like that. Um, now, I, I realize right now the situation in Rome is so bad that you know what the College of Cardinals approves may not be much better than what the Pope himself writes um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In his own head. But in theory we would hope by the time the second council of trent comes that there has been a rejuvenation of the of the vatican and of the curia and of the college of cardinals um, so that you have men like bishop schneider at that time is going to be cardinal schneider you know uh, and uh, you know that they will be the ones calling the shots now somebody could object that's an absurd idea do you realize how much that would slow things down. The Pope would hardly be able to publish anything. And you know what I would say? Great. Amen to that. <laughs> we, have, we have this flood, like like Noah's flood of documents coming from the Vatican. This has been going on now for 50 years and more. And, and I think we're, we're, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the height of that sort of pontifical garrulousness was found in, in the person of John Paul II, who was also the one who gave us, I think, the biggest papal personality cult with his globe trotting and so forth. I'm not saying he wasn't well-meaning, but yes. but the person I grew up during that era. This is my era. I grew up, and and I was all part of that personality cult uh, uh, of uh, John Paul II. And yes. it, it was really on. I mean, now that I look back at it, it's sort of like you looking back at yourself when you were a, a freshman at TAC uh, in the first chapter of your book, which I thought was very humble and very funny that you um, reproduced that letter in the journal entry um, yeah. back when you were a pious papalist. Um, well, you know, yeah, I mean, we grew up at the same time, and John Paul II was like a rock star. You know, yeah. if, if you look at the way he was treated at, at the World Youth Days, and, and you know, of course, there was the, the famous world or infamous World Youth Day in Denver uh, that caused Mother Angelica to you know, <laughs> sort of like, you know, uh, go, go, you know fi- finally just say, I'm, I'm going for blood. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, um, she had her Popeye the, moment. That's all I can stand. Yeah, I can't stand no more. Yes, exactly. The Stations of the Cross. Um, now, yeah, the cult of personality. Exactly. So really, the irony here, there are so many ironies on every level. The, the popes now, for, for, for decades, have they talk so much that it's, apart from a small number of Catholics who kind of, who are glued to their words because they give them a sort of guru status, you know, even though we know that for example, what a pope says in an interview is nothing but his personal opinion. It should have really no significance for any of us. But apart from a small number of people who who are glued to the guru aspect, um, the pope speaks so much that it's it's become very easy for us to ignore him and to his words. In other words, don't have the kind of moral authority, the kind of of um, weightiness you, that. The you, words of somebody will have when he chooses his words carefully and speaks only on special occasions. Okay, right? I, ju- I just found the page. You see on page one, 109, the Pope is at once far greater than ever and far more negligible. And when I, 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 I un- underline that and wrote an exclamation point aside of it, because, uh, because of this multiplicity of words, his words aren't few and grave and important they're mm-hmm. now so, uh, um, uh, well, so garrulous, so, so it's so yeah. verbose that um, you expect him to comment on anything and everything, and, right. and, and he obliges, and, and he becomes, unfortunately. Yeah, and he becomes a talking head. I mean, that is to say, like, we, we like to make fun sometimes of YouTube personalities um, 
who, I mean, I don't have anybody particular in mind, but there's this whole phenomenon now of people who are just constantly putting out show after show after show, talking about this, that, and the other thing, whether they have any competence or not, <laughs> you know, to talk about these issues. Uh, and and the, the Pope has, has become, you know, similar. The Pope should not give interviews where they just talk spontaneously and then it's broadcast all over the world. I mean, that's, it's really, when you stop and think about it, if you can just pull back and think about it as a sociological phenomenon and a cultural phenomenon, it is absolutely bizarre mm -hmm. what's going on with the papacy in modern times. Now, now uh, on the uh, going back to something a little bit more on the on the uh, dogmatic level, you quote, or at least paraphrase, um, uh, 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 Cardinal Ratzinger. I don't know what to call. I mean, Benedict the Sixteenth. I'm not sure what he was when he said this. The Pope is the servant of tradition, not its master. So again, this fits in with the papal oath, the concept of the papal oath. The Pope is the servant of tradition, not its master, because he he receives it and he has to guard it and and, and safeguard it and keep it and help it to be diffused. Uh, but but and and occasionally when errors come up, he has to define, and he might even have to do that <coughs> as the head of the college uh, college of bishops in an ecumenical council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know, <laughs> Father Hunnick, uh, Father John Hunnick of the Anglican Ordinariate, um, you know, I, I like to quote him regularly. I think all of us enjoy reading his his blog. Uh, but uh, he, he, you know, he, 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 one of his favorite quotations is when John Henry Newman says or describes the, um, the, the, the Holy See, the See of Rome, as being a remora, uh, a barrier against change, against innovation, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that historically Rome was the stick in the mud. You know, they, they, they were the ones who changed the slowest. They adopted customs after everybody else did, you know, <laughs> like, like praying the creed in the mass, right? It came to Rome at the en in, in the end, after, after it was being done elsewhere. And then finally Rome, you know, said, okay, I guess we'll do a creed during the mass, you know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, the conservatism was so um, famous that uh, that it, it was almost a reproach that some people could bring against Rome, that it wasn't an engine of, of doctrinal development. Well, it's not supposed to be. I mean, the, the engines of doctrinal development really are theologians, I would say, um, at least if they're doing their job well and responsibly. You know, it's going to be a mind like St. Thomas Aquinas's. Who, <laughs> who, I mean, Thomas isn't trying to be inno innovative, um, but in fact, he ends up being innovative uh, just because he's so good at what he's doing and, he, and his mind is so powerful and his gifts of grace so considerable that he ends up, you know, pioneering new paths in theology. And this is the – so the, the, those are – that's really where you have, you know, this fruitful – unearthing of ideas and a dialectic and conflict and the Franciscans against the Dominicans and the Jesuits and all these sorts of things, right? But the Pope is there kind of like an umpire in a game, right? Like, okay, as long as people are playing by the rules, as long as nobody is being violent, you know, or obscene or whatever, you know, just let them play, let it play out. And step up and blow the whistle when it's necessary. Yes, you know? yes, as he did have to do during the De Auxiliis controversy between the Dominicans right. and the Jesuits. Right, right. You have a chapter early on in the book called Portrait of a Perfect Pontiff. Aside from being highly alliterative, it's also very instructive because it's showing you that the, the book is not like ripping apart the Pope and saying, oh, you know, look, look, we need to really limit the papacy. That's not your point. Your point is to say we need to, we need to have a tradition, a papacy that's in line with the tradition of the church. And here, and, and in that particular p chapter, which I, I really liked, you go through the martyrology and you and you pick out all these pope saints, and you categorize them according to these different um, these different um, well categories that they fit into as you know missionary popes, popes who encourage the missions, like like Pope Saint Gregory, who who is responsible for the evangelism evangelism of England. Um, and the uh, but, but you talked about the martyr popes and these different popes, and then you, and then you give this sort of um, um, 
compl- complexus of the different virtues that a pope would have to have. And I thought it was a good read. I'm, I'm mentioning it um, so that the the audience gets a sense of what else is in the book by way of content. You also do this wonderful thing where you run the numbers, and I've never I've never seen this before. Where you know you talk about okay, we have these here. Here's a litany of loser popes. You know these popes who. You know, like Honorius and Liberius, and and uh, uh, who had doctrinal issues, and 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 um, uh, Pope um, what was the one at, at, who was dragged off to Constantinople and pulled down an altar when they were saying mass, and they tried to haul him away. Uh, Victor, Victor, um, uh, Vigilius. Vigilius. Thank you. Yeah. So you give these sort of doctrinally compromised popes, but then you give popes who were moral um, reprobates, like say a John the Twelfth. Um, but but then you say, but look, we have these 90 um, canonized popes, and we have a blessed among the pa- po- popes. And, you know, th- this amounts to, I think it was like a third of the popes who yes. were, um, uh, you know, extremely virtuous. Um, and then the, 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 the ones that we sort of, I'm calling them losers, the, the, the ones who sort of were spots on the Holy See, uh, they amount to three point something percent. So... The, the book isn't a, an attack against the papacy, as, again, again, these liberals are calling you that. They're saying you're attacking the papacy. I, I had a Twitter yeah. spat with somebody about this. Well, let's, yeah, this point about the numbers. I mean, somebody misinterpreted me uh, about this as well because they said, oh, look at look at Kwasniewski. You know, he's making a probabilistic argument. Like, you should, you should follow the pope because 97% of the popes have been good. No, that's not, that's not the point of the argument. What I say is that... Um, you know, there's this famous uh, statement. I, I, it, it, I, I read it first in Gary Lagrange, but I don't think he's the one who originated it. But it goes something like this. There is enough light uh, available in order to have faith, but there's enough darkness so that faith is not necess- necessitated. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. There's, there's enough light to believe. There's enough darkness to disbelieve. Um, and, and so the act of faith is a free act. It's not something compelled by the evidence the way that, say, uh, a conclusion in, in mathematics is compelled. Once we see the premises, we see that the conclusion must follow. Um, and so similarly, I was, I was making our analogous day, I was making the argument that if you look at the history of the papacy, what you can see is that God has protected it from – God has, has given us a 2,000-year sacred monarchy – that has no parallel in the history of the church, uh, in the history of the world, in the history of any other religion, not even anything close to it. And, you know, if if God had preserved one, if he had made 100% of popes saints, then we would probably be able to say with some high degree of probability, there will never be a pope who isn't a saint. Um, if most of the popes or even a very large number of them had been renegades morally or doctrinally, we would it would be hard for us, humanly speaking, to put our faith in in the, the papacy as an institution. But if the vast majority of popes have been either decent or exemplary, and a small number of them have been rotten or losers, to use your term, <laughs> then what that shows us is we we can trust the institution because it's in God's hands and he's going to guide it. But we still need to be vigilant. We still need to stand on our own two feet. We still need to know our faith just in case – we happen to be the ones living at the time of a Pope Honorius or yes. a Pope Vigilius or a Pope Liberius, uh, you know, or, or for that matter, uh, a Pope Paul VI, right? We need to be aware of, of what the faith is um, because clearly there were lay people in the fourth century, you know, who were supporting Athanasius, right? They weren't supporting the Arians or the semi-Arians or the compromisers, mm-hmm. And so that's that's really the point I was trying to make with those numerical comparisons. Yeah, and and the uh, the, the, the tomorrow's a feast of Saint Peter of Nisibis. He's, he's, he's mentioned in the Martyrology, and he was one of the ones at at uh, Nicaea. And it, you know, so here you have this example of a great uh, a bishop who uh, was part of the the defense of the church against Arianism. And uh, after after Vatican uh, after excuse me after Nicaea. 
you get the semi-Aryan crisis and you have, you know, lay people and, and monks and so forth having to hide out St. Athanasius because the semi-Aryans are in the ascendancy. But all of these historical, th- you know, th- these loser popes, as I call them, these, these difficult popes, th- the fact that the historians had to wrestle with this and they did at Vatican I shows you that we have the necessary tools to understand that these are a problem and that, you know, oh, every, no, people weren't saying everything the Pope says and does is great, so don't worry about it. The, yes, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, and, and another objection has been brought against me, which is, you know, you're attacking hyperpapalism, but if you ever got a Pope who was to your liking, you know, you'd be the, the first one cheering him on as, you know, you'd, you'd be more ultramontanist than the rest, right? And somehow people think that's an objection, right? Mm. But it's not. It's not at all. I mean, as, as you see from that per- portrait of a perfect pontiff, the Pope has massive authority for the good. Authority is always given for the good. It's not given for abuse. It's not given for violence. It's not given for cruelty. It's not given for the kind of things that Pope Francis is doing in Traditios Custodes, right? Yeah. But papal authority is given for confirming the brethren in the faith, for upholding and defending tradition, for promoting the beauty and solemnity and dignity of the liturgy, uh, for upholding marriage and family and and the, 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 the divine law on sexuality. That's what papal authority is for. So if a pope wants to come along like Pope Athanasius Schneider, okay, sorry, I keep using his example, but uh, if, if Pope Athanasius wants to come along and define, you know, a hundred dogmas of the faith against the modernists and the progressivists, I will cheer him on every step of the way. That's not that's not hyperpapalism. That's just the Pope doing his job. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Krasiewski, I'm afraid we have run out of time. So thank, thank you for a good interview. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on again. You've been listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel. God bless and may keep you. <laughs>